Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Flipgrid live event. My name's Anne, and I work on Team Flipgrid. I am so excited that you are joining us all today. And educator Katie from Zoo Montana is joining us today, too. But before I get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Flipgrid. We're a free video communication platform from Microsoft, and we're on a mission to empower every person on the planet to share their voice and respect the diverse voices of others. That is why we are so excited about today's event with Zoo Montana. Zoo Montana is located in Billings, Montana in the United States, and they are on a mission to fight for wildlife conservation. And in just a moment, educator Katie is joining us and she is going to teach us, she's an educator teaching learners all around the world about things like animal adaptations and conservation. So without further ado, everybody, please welcome educator Katie. It's all you, friend. Yeah, you got hi. it. Here, hi. Here go. Hi, friends. Thank you so much for that intro, Anne. That was so nice of you. We are super excited to be joining all of you today. There's so many of you here. We have friends from Poland, Idaho, Alberta, Canada, Virginia Beach, India, Seattle, Saskatchewan, Palm Beach, so many amazing places, Los Angeles, Pennsylvania, New York, the UAE, Texas, Georgia, Toronto, Canada, North Carolina, India, and Italy, and even Wisconsin. We have so many wonderful friends joining us today and it is so, so exciting that we get to have you here. Now, today is going to be very, very fun. First of all, I want to encourage you to use the Q&A because we will have a time for questions here shortly. Now, for the event today, we are going to be watching a really awesome video from our newest animal ambassadors. We are also going to be meeting some animal ambassadors in person and then we will talk about them, do a short Q&A, and we'll take a selfie together. But without any further ado, let's watch that video from our newest Animal Ambassador friends. Hi, everybody, and a big virtual welcome from Zoo Montana's Red Panda Habitat. Now, here at Zoo Montana, we have three Red Panda residents, Pabu, Meime, and Julie. Now, in the wild, Red Pandas are found throughout the highlands of Central Asia. And there's actually two subspecies of red panda. There's the Himalayan red panda that's found in the mountains of the Himalayas from Nepal to Assam. And there's also the Chinese red panda that's found in northern Burma to southern China. Now it's these two subspecies have arisen because they're separated by the Himalayan mountain range. And here at Zoo Montana, we are lucky enough to have both subspecies of red panda. Duli represents the Himalayan subspecies, while Pabu and Meime represent the Chinese subspecies. In the wild, red pandas are obligate bamboo eaters, meaning that that's the majority of or the only thing that they eat. In fact, they can eat up to 20,000 bamboo leaves in a single sitting. Here in Zoo Montana, they also feed on leaf eater biscuit and a variety of fruits and vegetables, in addition to bamboo. And despite this herbivorous diet, red pandas have a carnivorous evolutionary history. They have modified molars for tearing meat that we see in other carnivores like lions or hyenas. And they also have a simple digestive system. In fact, red pandas belong to their own unique family and contrary to their common name, they're not pandas at all. Genetic analysis has told us that red pandas are part of their own unique taxonomic group known as Iluridae, and they're not closely related to giant pandas. In a way, you can think of red pandas as a living fossil. Here at Zoo Montana, the red pandas spend lots of time above the ground, and this is because red pandas are arboreal, and they have a lot of adaptations for a lifetime in the trees. From a red coat that helps them blend in with the mosses and lichens in the highlands of Asia, to fur on the soles of their feet for extra traction, and modified forelimbs that help them climb headfirst down trees, red pandas are treetop extraordinaires. We hope you enjoyed this virtual encounter with Pabu, Meime, and Duli. 
Sweet. Thank you, Flipgrid team, for showing that video for us. And I am so excited to show you some real live animals in person. Now, as you saw, we talked about some amazing adaptations of red pandas, and we're going to continue that trend with the next two teachers. However, before I get started, I want to let you know, I'm not going to bring anything dangerous up here with me today. I want to be safe, and I want to make sure that my animal teacher friends are safe as well. That being said, there may be some animals that you might be a little bit afraid of today. And I want you to know, that's totally okay. I work with animals for a job, and even I have some animals that I'm a little bit hesitant about. What I want you to do is if you see an animal that you might be a little bit afraid of or even dislike, just take a deep breath and try to learn something cool about them. Because even if we don't like an animal or we are scared of them, they still have an extremely important role to play in their habitat and their homes. Okay, so an adaptation. If you've heard this word before, awesome. But if not, that's okay too. Because adaptations is one of those science words that has many different meanings. The meaning that we our favorite meaning here at the zoo, actually, is that an adaptation is a tool, either physically on an animal's body or a behavior that they do, that helps them to survive. So it could be anything like antlers, like above my head right here, could be claws, teeth, feathers, fur, scales, just about anything that they do. Those are the physical adaptations. And behavioral adaptations can be flying south or north for winters, or can be living in social groups like many herbivores do on different continents. So every living organism has adaptations you have adaptations cats and dogs have adaptations every living organism does so we're going to examine the adaptations of two other animal friends today since you already heard about our friends the red pandas and we have some pretty diverse groups to show you today you met a red panda in that video and now you're going to meet a reptile and a bird now don't forget to put your questions in the q a because we're going to have that chance to answer some questions after this program too, or after this bit with our two animal friends all right, I'm going to bring our very first animal teacher. Here we go. All right, my friends, this here is Leroy. And Leroy is a Colombian red-tailed boa. He was the one I was mostly talking about when I said we may or may not be scared or not like some of our animals. But Leroy is an excellent teacher and a great ambassador for his species, his other friends that live in the wild. Specifically, he is called a Colombian red-tailed boa, and there are some species of red-tailed boas throughout South America, typically named by the countries that they're typically found in. They can vary a little bit in size, but for the most part, Colombian red-tailed boas tend to be like Leroy here. They tend to be about six feet long. He weighs about 25 pounds, so he's a pretty good snake, and he has some really amazing adaptations. These animals tend to live in the rainforest, and they are colored to look like the shadows so they can blend in and hide from both predator and prey. Even though he's a, quite a big snake himself, he does have predators as well, just like we, or just like um, he, ha he is a predator himself. You want to climb up that way? Right now he's treating me like a tree, which is why he's kind of climbing all over the place, because he's exploring the area. Now, he is a carnivore, as you might expect. Nearly every species of snake is a carnivore, meaning they eat other animals. And in fact, he eats a lot of small mammals. But despite his size, he cannot eat me. I am way too big and he is way too small. Snakes can eat things bigger than their own heads though. Look how his head is. His head is about the length of my fingers and about the width of my fingers. So two of my fingers together is about how wide and as long his head is. But he can eat something as big around as the biggest part of his body, which is easily the size of a giant grapefruit. Now, to put that in human terms, that would be like if I could eat something as big around as my shoulders, like a giant pumpkin. I'd just be able to swallow it whole, stretch out my mouth. This adaptation is very helpful for snakes because they don't have the kinds of jaws that we do. Our jaws are with one solid bone, and they have some very strong muscles here. If you put your fingers here and bite down, you'll feel some muscles move. Those muscles are very strong, and they help you to mash up your food or chew up your food because our necks don't stretch, and we don't want to choke on our food. Their muscles instead are very different. They're very stretchy. Plus, all of their teeth are sharp and needle-like. And those sharp needle-like teeth are great for holding on to food, but not so much for chewing it. So with that jaw set up, plus they have four bones instead of just one in that jaw, the two bones in the back of their jaw help them to open up super wide. And then the two bones in the center here can split apart so that they can move their food into their mouth. Then their neck stretches and they eat things bigger than their heads. Pretty incredible adaptation there. And that's a tool for survival so that they can eat larger animals. 
but still, I am too big and he is too small. Now you might notice he's constantly flicking his tongue out. That's because snakes smell with their tongue. This is kind of a strange thing to think about because snakes have nostrils just like we do, but their nostrils are just meant for breathing. They're not meant for smelling. Instead, when he flicks out his tongue, he has cells on his tongue that can pick up smells. And then he has a special organ in the roof of his mouth called the Jacobson's organ. The Jacobson's organ allows him to basically compute what smells he's getting and tell his brain what he's smelling. It's an incredibly powerful sense of smell. Now, again, I mentioned earlier that he is climbing on me as if I am a tree because these trees are partially, or these trees, these snakes are partially arboreal. So he likes to spend a lot of time up in trees especially when they're younger. So right now he's looking for more places to climb high up to. Snakes are also what we call cold-blooded. Now you've probably heard this before, and cold-blooded is one of those, another science word that is kind of difficult to understand. In fact, I didn't even understand it very well, and I work in this job for a long time. So my favorite way to talk about cold-blooded is to talk about the scientific word form, which is ectothermic. Ecto means outside and thermic means heat or temperature. So an ectothermic animal gets their heat or temperature from outside of their body. We are endothermic animals, which means we get our heat from inside our body. Some of the food that we eat, we take energy from that to keep our blood at about 98 degrees. It doesn't matter if it's 100 degrees outside or zero degrees Fahrenheit. That our blood is always going to stay 98 degrees. However, an outside heat ectothermic animal, a cold blooded animal like this snake here, his blood temperature will change depending on the temperature around him, which is why you don't find many snakes, especially this big, like up all the way up here in Montana, because we're pretty far north in the northern hemisphere, right around the 45th parallel. Hey, snakes also have pretty good eyesight, but that, hey, you're just moving around all the way. <laughs> snakes also have pretty good eyesight, but when you're at ground level or stuck in a bunch of really leafy trees, good eyesight isn't always the easiest. So that's why they use that tongue to smell. All right, my friends, we're going to talk about conservation after we meet our next animal friend. So if you would like to wave goodbye to our friend Leroy here and make sure you put your snake questions in the chat. All right, I'm going to go grab our next animal teacher. my friends. I did say we were going to meet a bird. This here is Sydney, and Sydney is a laughing kookaburra. Now we met Leroy, the red tail boa, who's from South America, and now we're meeting Sydney, the laughing kookaburra, who is all the way from Australia. And they tend to live in the woodlands in Australia, though occasionally you can see them in the cities, I've heard. The laughing kookaburras are a pretty iconic bird, and I've also been told that they are called the Bushman's alarm clock because they tend to call rather loudly at early times in the morning. However, they are an amazing bird. Now, the kookaburra part of their name is actually from the Wiradjuri um, Aboriginal tribe's name for them, Gugubara, and that is how they were named, and they have some pretty fun calls. Now, those calls are adaptations in and of themselves because these are what we call a semi-social bird, which means most of the time they'll spend time in large groups, or at least in family groups of multiple years, kind of like a wolf pack. But sometimes if there's not enough food, they are only together during the breeding season and hatching season, and then they're off on their own. When they do live in large groups, they use these loud calls that they're known for to call to each other, communicate if there's a predator nearby, or to declare territory. Now, I'm about to sound really silly, but I'm going to see if she wants to call for us today. I can't make her call because, you know, she's her own bird and she does what she wants, but we'll see if she wants to call for us today. <laughs> We'll try again a little bit later, but she's a pretty awesome bird. Maybe I should get more comfortable. Now, fun fact about this bird. If you live here in North America, we don't have kookaburras here. They're a really cool bird, but we don't have them here. However, her shape may look a little bit familiar, and that's because she's a member of the Kingfisher family, and in fact, the largest member of the Kingfisher family. So she's got that long boat-like beak. She's got the smaller head and the big body, and then a nice, decently long tail that she shares in common with most other kingfishers. Now, unlike most other kingfishers, in Australia, she doesn't eat much fish. She spends her time hunting for 
lizards and snakes and mice and other small animals like that. Now, if you're at all familiar with animals like hawks, buzzards, and vultures and eagles, you probably noticed that she doesn't have a sharp hooked beak like those birds. She also has teeny tiny little toes with not some very sharp talons. That means that she is not using those talons to grab her food like those other birds, the hawks and eagles and owls. Instead, she has to rely entirely on that beak. And we'll talk about that too, but the first way that she actually even finds her food is with her eyesight. She has very good eyesight. She can see more colors than we can, and their brains process things faster than ours, so she can th see things moving faster than we can, which is so cool to think about. So if she's up in a tree, say on a branch like this, and she's focused on something, she can hold her head still while the rest of her body moves around her. So if she's focused on a lizard or a snake that's on the ground, she can stay focused on it even if the branch is swaying in the wind. She's not super focused right now, but I hope you saw some of that as we were talking there. When she spots that prey, she'll dive down after it, fly down, and grab it in that big boat-like beak. It has lots of very strong muscles that allow her to squeeze pretty hard, but unlike our constrictor friend, the red-tailed boa who squeezes his food to death, she does something else. She picks up her prey with her beak, and then she shakes it really hard and really fast. This basically breaks the neck of her prey and kills it instantly. And then, to make it nice and easy to swallow, just like some of us might tenderize a meat for a steak, she smacks her food against the ground or against a branch. It's pretty strange to see and a little bit scary, but it's actually pretty cool the why, reason why she does that. And then because she doesn't have any teeth, she just has that beak, she swallows her food whole. Now you might notice she has lots of feathers on her body. She is a bird and that's one of those characteristics that is unique to all living birds. She also would lay hard shelled eggs and she would brood on those eggs to keep them warm. Even though they are warm blooded, when the baby chicks are in the egg, they still need the protection of their parents. Now, after she swallows that snake or lizard whole, she then can hang out and look for her own predators, which are things like mostly just other large hawks and eagles. She doesn't have many other predators, but she does need to keep a lookout for them. And one of the ways that she can do this is it's not really camouflage, because as you can see, she's not she doesn't look really like the bark of a tree for the most part. But the back of her head here, see it's kind of that V-shaped back there? It's meant to kind of look like her beak is staring at you so that she can kind of trick predators into thinking that she's facing them and hopefully they'll leave her alone rather than trying to ambush her. <laughs> we'll see if she wants to here in a minute, but she is a very awesome bird. Now birds in general are super cool and have so many amazing adaptations. In general, most of the birds that can fly, other than penguins and um, ostriches and the, those related to them, their bones are practically hollow. It's kind of like if you had a straw, but that straw kind of had a few lines inside of it. They're called struts, basically. The inside of their bones kind of looks like a honeycomb. It's empty, but it's got some supporting struts inside of it that make it extremely strong, which is why birds can fly. It also makes them extremely lightweight. Sydney here weighs about a pound and a half, maybe about 600 grams. She is a very lightweight animal, and this is part of what allows her to fly so well. Now, you might have noticed I've been saying that Sydney is a she, and the reason that we know this is because of the colors of her feathers. Like many birds around the world, male birds and female birds can have different colors, although that's not the case in all birds. But in this kookaburra species, typically, though not always, there's always an exception in biology, the males have more blue on their wings. She has just a few lower dots of blue on her wings, but the males typically have a lot more static. Sorry, I didn't need to get in your space there. So just like us, as you can tell, animals communicate with both sound and body language. Just like we can shrug our shoulders, shake our heads no, or nod our heads yes, animals can communicate with movements of their body as well. When she moved her body like that, it was telling me that she didn't want me to touch her. That's another important point about Sydney here. Sydney is an animal ambassador. She's not a pet. This means that she is here to teach people about her species in the wild and how to protect them, how to conserve them. She's not here because she likes to be pet by us or because she wants to cuddle with me. She's here because she's a teacher. So all the animals that live here at Zoo Montana are here because they're here to teach other people about their species in the wild so that we can help them. Now, some of the conservation threats that actually affect both of the animals that you've seen today, despite living on vastly different continents, are things like habitat loss or climate change. I'm sure you've heard all about climate change, but it affects nearly all animals in the world, including us. So it's important to think about how we can help the animals as well. 
All right, my friends. So that was a pretty quick intro to a bunch of these animals. I really hope that you are putting some questions in the Q&A because I would love to hear that. But first, let's take a selfie together. And what I want you to do for this selfie part is stand in front of your screen, take a big picture together. We're going to have Sydney in the picture with us. Now, this is important. If you want to, you can even tag us on social media, whether that is Facebook, whether that is Instagram, whether that is Twitter, you can tag us on those things and also tag our friends Flipgrid. So it's just at Zoo Montana and at Flipgrid. So I'll give you a minute. I'm going to stand here smiling with Sydney and we are going to hope that you take a photo. Don't forget, all you have to do is get up in front of the screen together, take a big picture together, show us your awesome smiles or your smiles, your eyes smiling like I am right now if you are in person, and let us know where you're at and how you've been enjoying this program. Are you gathering in front of your screen? If you've already taken your photo, that's awesome. Make sure that you put any questions you have in the Q&A box, because I'd love to answer as many questions as we can at the end of this program. Sydney's posing very nicely right now. She's looking off all heroically into the distance to show us that we can all help. <laughs> She's actually doing very good. <laughs> All right, don't forget, take a photo in front of your screen. Make sure that you tag us at Zoo Montana and tag our friends at Flipgrid too, so we can see your faces from across the world. We have so many friends here and it's so exciting. She's thinking about it. She just wants me to sound silly. But hopefully while we've been practicing this, you've gotten a chance to take a photo. We'll give you a few more seconds to do that. And then I think Anne is still there. She might have some questions for me. I am educator Katie. We have incredible questions coming in from literally around the world. Are you ready for some of these? Let's do it. Awesome. David Burke's second grade class and many students all over are wondering how many animals you have at the zoo? That's a great question. There are many animals that call Zoo Montana home. We have a ton of different animals, but we have about 80 different individuals, not including our colonies of things like Madagascar, hissing cockroaches, and Vietnamese walking sticks from about 56 different species. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. And we just had this one come in. Arthav is curious, are all of the animals safe from coronavirus? Oh, that is an excellent question. You might have noticed that I'm wearing a mask. And part of that is to just to be safe, right? For the most part, coronaviruses are not super uncommon in mammal species. They were known before the COVID-19 pandemic became a reality. However, just to be safe, I am making sure that I sanitize between my animal friends and I make sure that I wear my mask around them. Reptiles, at least as far as most of veterinarians know, cannot get COVID-19 or most of the other coronaviruses. But mammals can, theoretically, and birds, not as likely, but it's a possibility. So we're just making sure that we are being safe. Here at the zoo, we've had no possible, we've had no, um, no one actually has been, we've been very lucky to have no positive cases of COVID-19. Oh, great practices, thank you. Now, Madam Liberty's class is curious, do you give every single animal a name? Ooh, that is a really good question. We give nearly all of our animal friends this, a name. And the reason I say nearly is because of those colonies of insects, really cool insects that I named earlier, the Madagascar hissing cockroaches and the Vietnamese walking sticks. The only reason that we don't name every single one of those is because there's over 60 different walking st sticks in that uh, habitat. And there are over 100 different species or 100 different individuals in the Madagascar hissing cockroach house. Yeah, nearly every animal. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And we have a student, Kinley, in Miss Mingo's class. Kinley is wondering, how does Zoo Montana get their animals? 
That is an excellent question, Kinley. I love that question. So there are usually three ways that we acquire our animals. The first one is from other zoos. Sydney here was born in another zoo facility. We didn't take her from the wild. She was born in another zoo so that she could be a teacher about her species. Another place that we get animals, the only really time we get them from the wild is if they are permanently injured. We have multiple species of red tail, or excuse me, of raptors, like red tailed hawks, a golden eagle, a couple of bald eagles, and a couple of owl species who were injured in the wild so badly that they cannot survive on their own. So they come to live here at Zoo Montana, a super comfy life, and they still get to teach people about their species. The last place that we sometimes get animals from is from people. Sometimes if people haven't made enough or done enough research, if they haven't done enough research, they get a cool pet because it sounds cool and then realize that they actually don't either want to take care of a pet and fulfill all its needs or that they don't want to take care of it for the amount of time that they're supposed to live. So Leroy, actually, the red tail boa, was somebody's pet before he came to us and that somebody did not know how to take care of him and they just thought it'd be really cool to have him for a pet. They realized this and were able to bring him to us so that we could give him the best care possible. Oh my gosh, incredible. It's awesome hearing about your animal ambassadors and all the ways they can teach and inform alongside you, Educator Katie. I have a question now specifically about the Zoo Montana Flipgrid Discovery Library topics. I know we have friends tuning in literally from around the world and educators are using Flipgrid to have their students reflect on their learning, share those aha moments or takeaways. And we definitely want folks to reflect on their learning today. So Katie, we know that Zoo Montana has shared incredible ready to use discovery library resources. And one of those is about a collection called um, Oh my gosh, zookeeping, right? So uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. We have been having so much fun creating content for these Flipgrid um, collections. And the one that we wanted to highlight today is called Be the Zookeeper, Build a Habitat. So in these collections, we have about six videos up, I believe. And in those videos, you get to see educator Emily from here at the zoo talking about how we created different habitats for different animals around the zoo. In those videos, you are also challenged to create your own habitat as if you were the zookeeper designing it and keeping in mind all of the important parts of that habitat. It's really fun. That is so cool. So Katie, we're actually going to share with folks how easy it is for teachers, educators, parents, and guardians to use these topics and find your collection. So my good friend Chris is going to share his screen and we're going to walk through how simple it is. Friends, when you are on your browser, you simply need to type in aka.ms slash zookeeper. And this will take you directly to Zoo Montana's Flipgrid collection, Be a Zookeeper, Build the Habitat. So what you're seeing on screen right now is ready to use topics all about what it takes to become a zookeeper. And we did have that question, folks were curious, how do you become a zookeeper? These topics are ready to use that can help explore that answer. Now, Chris is showing the multi-species habitat topic, and you'll notice information right on the page to help you get the most out of this topic with your students and your learning community. You also notice a blue box on the screen that says add topic. And once you click on this, you will be able to choose if you want to use the topic individually or add it to your Flipgrid group. And you can think of a group as a classroom. When you add it, you'll be able to edit it and customize it to make it meaningful for you and your learning community. So it's it. It's that simple. And then the fun begins when you share that topic with your students and you let them reflect on their learning, those aha moments, the takeaways, even from today with you, Educator Katie. So they definitely can have fun using all of those creative elements inside the Flipgrid camera as well. Katie, I want to sneak in another question because we had so 
many folks asking. I know Eaton School was asking about this, Ms. Grant's class, Mr. Brown and Mrs. Wilgaki's class. They were very curious about how you train the animals. For example, train the snake not to bite you and the string that is attached to Sydney. So can you talk a little bit about how you train your animal ambassadors? Absolutely. So at zoos, in most zoos, we use something called positive reinforcement training, which means there's no punishment involved if an animal doesn't do what we want them to do. When Sydney, for example, was training, this is a set of equipment called a Jess and a leash, and they're attached to anklets. So just like if you walk a dog or a cat, they have a harness or a leash with their collar. This is something to make sure that she stays safe. We're down here in my distance learning studio, which is not her normal home. And if something spooks her down here, a, a different noise or someone walking around, she might get hurt if she were to fly off. So this makes sure that she stays with me and stays safe. To train her with this, what we do is we slowly work different animals very slowly, offering them treats when they do something we ask. So even from the very beginning, it, we didn't even use equipment from when she was first training. We would just ask her to step up to our hands. To, do, to entice her, to make it a good thing for her, we would have her favorite foods. When she would step up, she would get a treat. If she didn't step up, there's no punishment. She just doesn't get the treat right then. It's not like we're withholding their food either. For animals like the snakes, similar training happens. We get them used to being handled by people. And when I say get them used to that, that just means that we're not gonna force them to be in a situation they don't want to be in because that's how bites happen. 99% of the time, the only two reasons an animal is going to bite you is if they're uncomfortable or scared, or if you smell like their food. I don't smell like a mouse, so my animal friend is probably not going to bite me because I smell like his food. Plus, I'm making sure that he feels safe. I'm not grabbing him strongly to hurt him. I'm not hurting her. I'm making sure that our animal teacher friends feel safe. And I do that by watching their body language. As you notice, I interrupted our program a couple times to say hello or talk to the animals so that they understand that, I, well, as best as we can, at least by my tone of voice, that they are not in, they're not uh, in danger. So a lot of the training takes a lot of time, but it's all for the health of the animals and the safety of the animals. Even animals like tigers here at the zoo or the red pandas. The tigers, we definitely wouldn't do something like this with, right? We don't want to go in with them because that could hurt us and that would put them in danger. So we train them to participate in their own health care. We train them to be able to stand still when we need to take an x-ray. We train them to do all sorts of fun things, but they're all important for their health. That is incredible to hear you talk about that process. Thank you so much. And Educator Katie, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time to teach us and have your ambassadors teach us as well. I appreciate you sharing your expertise and, and your friends at Zoo Montana. So I wanted to ask if you have any final thoughts for all of our friends who are listening in. I do. So this is kind of my favorite part of the program, other than the live animals, of course, because this is the part where we get to realize that together we can all save the world. And what I mean by that is while it's easy to feel powerless about things like climate change or habitat loss, there are things that you can do to help and things that you're already doing. Just by attending this program, you are helping because you are learning things, right? And that's really important. You're helping to fight the good fight for conservation just by learning. To take it further, tell someone else about this program and what you learned. You can, you know, reduce our single our use of single use plastics. We can take a reusable bag to the grocery store, which is becoming a norm in so many places and it's awesome. We can even, you know, support different companies that are transparent about their impact on the environment. Just like the behaviors of our red panda friends, our red cell boa friends, our kookaburra friends have impacts on their environments, so do ours because we're not separate from the natural world. We are very much a part of it. Katie, that is fantastic advice and a great message. Help learn and tell others to spread the message of conservation. Thank you so much. Friends, remember you can find all of those Zoo Montana ready to use Flipgrid Discovery Library resources. I believe they already shared the link inside the chat. And for those of you who are curious, we're here every Wednesday with live events, so we would love to invite you back for the next one. You definitely can check out the upcoming programs if you visit aka.ms slash Flipgrid Live Events. Just register and we'll be here at the same time every Wednesday. And don't forget, we have a special event coming up this Friday with the Met Museum. Friends, remember, 
Zoo Montana, ready to use resources. And educators and parents, if you want to find out a little bit more about how to use Flipgrid, I work with an incredible team of educators. Jess, Feli, Jornay, and I are all here to help you with Flipgrid professional development. You're welcome to join us for a session, and you can find that info at aka.ms slash Flipgrid P as in pineapple, D as in dog, Flipgrid P D. Friends, thank you for tuning in and learning alongside Educator Katie and the Animal Ambassadors from Zoo Montana. We are so glad you were able to spend this time learning with us, and I wish you an awesome day. Stay safe and take care. Bye!